Hello. So we start now the second phase of the Fourier analysis course, Fourier transform. So we leave for some time the study of Fourier series and pick up the other aspect of Fourier analysis, namely the study of Fourier transforms. So the next three chapters will be on Fourier transforms. We will return back to Fourier series later in the next part of the course. Recall that in basic ODE theory, where one studies ordinary differential equations with constant coefficients, say for simplicity we take y double prime plus a y prime plus b y equal to 0 where a and b are constants. One seeks special solutions of the form e to the power mx where m is the root of the characteristic polynomial. More generally, one would seek solutions of the form px times e to the power mx where p is a polynomial when the differential equation has repeated roots. This will be so when the characteristic polynomial has repeated roots. Say if a root m is repeated twice then e to the power mx and x e to the power mx are both solutions. If a root m is repeated thrice then e to the power mx, x e to the power mx and x square e to the power mx will all be solutions and so the taking linear combinations we will have px times e to the power mx where p is a polynomial. If m has multiplicity 3 then p will be a quadratic polynomial and so on. So this procedure is well known to all of you from undergraduate courses. Now let us see what happens when you try this kind of an approach with a partial differential equation. A partial differential equation has several independent variables x1, x2, xn. Now we could look at the fundamental equations arising in physics such as the Laplace's equation, the wave equation, heat equation and it is natural to ask for exponential solutions. What will be exponential solutions? How do they look? You look at equation 4.1 in, uh, in the display x of i parenthesis x1 chi1 plus x2 chi2 plus dot 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 plus xn chi n. So this is an example of a plane wave. The plane wave with frequency vector chi1 chi2 chi n. More general solutions can be obtained by taking linear combinations or superpositions as you would say it in physics. In the case of the wave equation for example utt minus uxx equal to 0 where you recall that utt denotes del 2u by del t squared uxx denotes del 2u by del x squared. So utt minus uxx equal to 0 let us substitute the ansatz 4.1 into the differential equation. Here there are only two variables x and t. So n is 2 and then we take the ansatz in the form x of i a t minus b x. So one of the variables is t, the other variable is x, the corresponding frequency vector is a comma minus b. So when I substitute this into 4.2 what do you get? you get the equation a squared minus b squared equal to 0. Now unlike the ODE case this equation 4.3 has infinitely many solutions. In fact you can take a equal to lambda b equal to lambda for any choice of lambda or you could take a equal to lambda b equal to minus lambda and we got two families of solutions x of i lambda x plus t and x of i lambda x minus t and lambda is an arbitrary parameter and now we have to take superpositions and we have to take continuous superposition because lambda is a continuous real variable which means we should be looking at integrals with a certain density functions namely integral minus infinity to infinity f of lambda x of i lambda into x plus t d lambda or you could take a continuous superposition of these things you will get integral minus infinity to infinity with the density function g lambda 
x of i lambda times x minus lambda d lambda equation 4.4 is a very general solution of the wave equation utt minus uxx equal to 0. Okay. So now we are naturally led to the following definition. Suppose f from r to c is a function which is in L1, that is it is absolutely integrable on the real line. Then the Fourier transform f hat of chi is defined to be the integral minus infinity to infinity f of t e to the power minus i t chi dt. And this integral is called the Fourier transform of f. And so you see that these integrals that you see here are basically Fourier transforms. In fact, it is the first integral is the Fourier transform of f evaluated at explicity and the second one is the Fourier transform of g evaluated at x minus t. There are several different conventions for the Fourier transform. In some books, they put a 2 pi factor here in the exponent. So they will define it to be integral minus infinity to infinity f of t e to the power minus 2 pi i t chi. That is one convention. The other convention they will put a factor of 1 upon root 2 pi in front of the integral. There are several conventions and we shall follow the convention that is common in the theory of partial differential equations. For example, G. B. Fallon's book on Fourier analysis and its applications, page 213. We will follow the convention that is given in Fallon's book. So let us look at number of examples of Fourier transform computations. So let us take the simplest example where the function f is a characteristic function of the interval minus 1, 1. So what is the Fourier transform? Just put the definition f hat of chi is integral over r f of t e to the power minus i t chi dt. Of course, e to the power minus i t chi is cosine t chi minus i times sine t chi. Now, f of t is an even function. So, the sine integral will drop out and we will have the cosine integral. It will go from minus 1 to 1 because the function is 0 outside the interval minus 1 to 1. So, it is basically twice integral 0 to 1 cosine chi t dt. We can obviously integrate cosine chi t dt. It is sine chi t upon chi and you put the limits 0 and 1, you will simply get 2 sin chi upon chi. So we have computed explicitly a Fourier transform. Now let us take the next example, compute the Fourier transform of the function given by f of t equal to 1 upon square root of 1 minus t square if mod t less than 1 and f of t equal to 0 if mod t greater than or equal to 1. Again it is an even function. So as in the previous example, the sine integral will drop out. We will get twice integral 0 to 1 cosine chi t divided by root of 1 minus t square dt. Now suppose I put t equal to sine theta, then dt by root of 1 minus t squared is d theta. And then you got, you got integral cosine of chi sin theta d theta and the integral will go from 0 to pi by 2. And if you go to the first part of the course, we have looked at the integral representations for the Bessel's function and you can consult that part and you can write down the Fourier transform in terms of Bessel's function. The next exercise is a theorem called the riemann lebesgue lemma. Prove the riemann lebesgue lemma which says that if f of t is a continuous function and the integral 4.5 is finite. If you have a L1 function which is also continuous, then the Fourier transform f hat of chi decays to 0 as chi tends to plus infinity or minus infinity. Now let us look at how to do this. First of all, a function f is absolutely integrable. f is in L1 on the real line. What does it mean to say that f, f is in L1 on the real line? Given any epsilon greater than 0, there is a certain interval i outside which the contribution of the function to the integral is vanishingly small. 
that means outside a large interval integral of mod fx dx is less than epsilon by 3. So I have selected a k bigger than 0 such that integral mod fx dx on r minus minus k k is less than epsilon by 3. So now we must estimate the Fourier transform mod f hat of chi. What is mod of f hat of chi? Take the modulus less than or equal to integral minus infinity to infinity mod ft dt because the exponential factor is unit complex number and when mod t is bigger than chi the integral is less than epsilon. So now we have to understand what happens when mod t is less than chi. That is the only part that you need to worry about and over there the integral will go from minus k to k f of t e to the power minus t chi dt. Can you think of imitating the proof of the riemann lebesgue lemma from the last part of the course? You should think about that. The next problem, compute the Fourier transform of f of t equal to 1 upon a squared plus t squared. Again it is a even function, a is a non-zero real number so a squared is always positive, the function is integrable over the real line and the Fourier transform will have a cosine term and a sine term. The sine integral will be 0 because it is even function and sine is odd. So the cosine term will, will remain integral from minus infinity to infinity cosine t chi upon a squared plus t squared. You will have to use complex analysis to compute this integral. You can use Cauchy integral theorem to find the value of the integral and I leave it to you to do this problem. Let us calculate next the Fourier transform of e to the power minus a mod t where a is positive. Of course again it is an even function you can put in the definition of the Fourier integral x of minus a mod t times cosine chi t integral from 0 to infinity with a 2 factor thrown in. Where does the 2 factor come from? Cosine is an even function. And so it is twice integral 0 to infinity e to the power minus a t cos chi t. Now if you remember some of the formulas for the Laplace transform then you will be able to evaluate this integral or directly also you can try to do an integration by parts twice and you can compute the integral. Exercise is continued looking at the last two example are you led to conjecture any result. For example you could compute the Fourier transform of the function f of t equal to 1 upon a squared plus t squared. You will get some result which is closely resembles this. If you take the Fourier transform of this you are going to get something which closely resembles this. And so you will basically conjecture the Fourier inversion formula which will come very soon. So just by looking at these two examples are you able to draw any conjectures, formulate any conjectures. Calculate the Fourier transform of f of t equal to sin squared t upon t squared using the ideas of exercise 4 above. Exercise 4 above is to use complex analysis and using contour integration to compute the integral. One can also use the Fourier transform of f of t equal to sin t by t but a careful justification would have to wait. Remember one thing that the integral sin t by t is a conditionally convergent integral. f of t equal to sin t by t is not a function in L1. So how do you interpret its Fourier transform? Because we have defined the Fourier transform only for L1 function so far and so justifying this would be a bit of a problematic thing but we can do that. There is a way to circumvent the problem and to arrive at the answer. We look at these things later as the course progresses. Try to calculate the convolution of two things f of a and f of b where f of a t is a by pi times x squared plus a squared. So you have to first recall the definition of convolution and you want to calculate the convolution of these two functions. 
Don't be surprised if the computation gets pretty ugly. As we develop more theory of Fourier transform, we can get this convolution without too much calculations using the Fourier inversion theorem and the convolution theorem. This example comes up in probability and this f of a comes under the name of Cauchy distribution. The Fourier transform of the Gaussian. This is one of the most important examples in the theory of Fourier transforms and plays a crucial role in probability theory, number theory and quantum mechanics, theory of heat conductions and diffusive processes in general. Theorem 39, suppose A is positive, the Fourier transform of x of minus a t squared is a function root pi by a x of minus chi squared by 4 a. So this theorem we have already seen in the first module where we obtained a first order ODE for the Fourier transform i chi equal to integral minus infinity to infinity x of minus a t squared minus i t chi d t. We differentiated this under the integral sign, integrated by parts and we got a first order ODE for i chi and we computed this general solution of this first order ODE and we calculated the constant also. Here we will give a second proof of this very fundamental result in Fourier analysis. So let us com complete the square in the previous integral. Completing the square, we get i chi equal to e to the power minus chi squared by 4a integral minus infinity to infinity x of minus a into t plus i chi by 2a the whole square dt. It is very tempting to make a substitution t plus i chi by 2a equal to y in 4.7 and proceed formally. Well, we shall refrain from doing this because it is procedurally wrong. It is wrong to make this kind of substitution in, in integrals. I asked you a question, can you explain why? Now before I tell you the correct way to do this, let me give you a hint as to why this kind of formal manipulations is procedurally wrong. Take the integral j equal to integral 0 to infinity tx upon 1 plus x to the power 4. Let us do a formal substitution. Let us simply put x equal to iy and let us say dx is i dy. Then the integral becomes j equal to integral 0 to infinity i dy upon 1 1 plus i to the y to the power 4. In other words, you get j equal to i j and you will conclude erroneously that j is 0. But how can j be 0? You are integrating a positive function. The reason why this is wrong is because when I make a complex substitution in an integral, the, what was the original integral? Integral 0 to infinity dx upon 1 plus x to the power 4. What substitution did I make? x equal to i y. What has happened? The contour of integration which was the real axis has now become the imaginary axis. The correct way to do this is to apply Cauchy's theorem to the sector from 0 to r along the real axis from r to i r along the quadrant of a circle of radius r centered at the origin and then back along the imaginary axis from i r to 0. The integral over this plus integral over this plus integral over this will be equal to 2 pi i times the residue which is sitting inside. There is a residue, there is a simple pole sitting inside this and there is a residue and this is going to pick up the residue. The integral along the quadrant of the circle will go to 0 as r goes to infinity. So we will get that the integral along the real axis will be equal to the integral along the imaginary axis plus 2 pi i times the residue at e to the power i pi by 4. 
when we do this blind substitution, we are ignoring this residue. That's why we got the wrong answer. Here in this example, a strange thing happens. Even if you make the substitution, the method is wrong, but the answer that you get will be correct. We will now explain why is it that you get a correct answer, but the method is procedurally wrong. We will now use complex analysis. We will use Cauchy's theorem for a rectangle. Which function are we integrating? f of z equal to e to the power minus a z squared. What are the contour over which you are going to integrate? Along the real axis from minus r to r and then vertically from r to r plus i chi by 2a and then back from r plus i chi by 2a to minus r plus i chi by 2a and finally from minus r plus i chi by 2a back to minus r. So the rectangle and as r goes to infinity the contribution from the piece on the real axis from minus r to r is going to give you an integral integral minus infinity to infinity e to the power minus a x squared dx and you know the value of the integral and then along this piece from r plus i chi by 2a to minus r plus i chi by 2a you are going from right to left you have to put a minus sign because this because the direction has gone reversed and that is going to give you the integral that you want and then you have to look at the contribution from the two vertical sides of the rectangle and r goes to infinity and they both go to zero. There are no residues, it's an entire function and so you don't pick up any residues and you get that's why you get the correct answer. So you carry out this particular thing and you will get integral over the base of the rectangle, integral over the two vertical sides, integral over the top of the rectangle L2 is 0, 4.9. As r goes to infinity, the integral along the base of the rectangle gives, gives you a known integral root pi by root a. Taking into account the direction of the top of the rectangle, we have a minus sign, integral from minus infinity to infinity, x of minus a into t plus i chi by 2a the whole square dt that is minus j and the contribution for the vertical sides v1 and v2 individually go to 0 as r goes to infinity and that completes the proof of this very important theorem 39. We have given now two different proofs for the Fourier transform of the Gaussian. One using ODEs and one using complex analysis is a very important example that's why we have worked with it rather meticulously. Now let's go a little further. Review the earlier procedure for calculating i chi via ODs that I have we already done. Exercise 11, compute the Fourier transform of x squared e to the power minus a x squared, more generally x to the power 2k x of minus a x squared. If you take x to the power 2k plus 1, x of minus a x squared, what are you going to get? You please figure out. You are going to get a cosine integral and you are going to get a sine integral and you see what you get, whether you get anything computable. For x to the power 2k you will be able to compute. When you take x to the power 2k plus 1, the cosine integral will drop out but the sine integral will be problematic. How to do this problem? How to calculate the Fourier transform of x to the power 2k e to the power minus a x squared? You already know the Fourier transform of e to the power minus a t squared and that is this. Differentiate under the integral sign with respect to a. Differentiate under the integral sign with respect to a. When you differentiate e to the power minus a t squared with respect to a, it is going to be e to the power minus a t squared times t squared. By differentiating under the integral sign, you can get the Fourier transform of this. Further differentiations, repeated differentiations will give you this. Now we will introduce in the next module a convenient function space to work with. This is the Schwarz space S of rapidly decreasing functions. We have computed the Fourier transform of e to the power minus ax squared. 
and x squared e to the power minus a x squared. These are examples of rapidly decreasing functions. They decay very rapidly as x goes to infinity and the derivatives also decay very rapidly as x goes to infinity. And when you multiply them by polynomial and then you differentiate, they still decay very rapidly as x goes to infinity. Such functions, such functions, they form a vector space and this vector space plays a very important role in the theory of the Fourier transform. This vector space we'll study next time. We'll stop this module here. Thank you very much.